Have you ever sat down across from the value deck that's starting to go for it? If you've played Commander for any length of time, you know that feeling. The landfall deck plays a land, creates a 5-5 token, a 1-1 token, a clue token, and draws a card. Then, they have cast an exploration, play another land, create another 5-5, 1-1, clue, and draw. Or on the other side of the coin, the focus deck gets off to a fast start with land, ramp, ramp, and starts getting their aggressive creatures online a turn earlier than usual to start swinging. We all know that feeling of dread at seeing one of our opponents playing way more spells, triggering way more abilities than the rest of us. It can be hard to put to words why you feel like you're losing. Hello and welcome to another episode of Gemstone Mine. I'm John, and today we have another lesson from CEDH. CEDH is a metagame that sits within the Commander format at one extreme with highly consistent, highly efficient decks. Not all cards are equally powerful in all formats, or even in all metagames, but there are lessons to be learned from how people are brewing with the most powerful cards available. And it was in a CDH podcast, specifically an episode of The Mind Sculptors, where I first heard the concept of game actions in the action economy described in the context of magic. Today, we're going to break it down, because the action economy is one of those secrets to success at the format of Commander at all levels of play. So we have to ask ourselves, what is a game action? The concept comes from a lot of other tabletop games like RPGs and board games, where the primary economy in the game is managing your actions. Your action, bonus action, and move during a game of D&D, for example. Apart from true turn-based actions, like drawing a card, untapping your lands, there's not a lot in Magic that seems clearly to be paralleling this. But in fact, game actions really do underlie a lot of what makes players powerful in a game of Commander. Fundamentally, there are three meaningful types of game actions that you can take in a game of Magic. Number one, you can move a card from one zone to another, draw a card, cast a creature, destroy an artifact. Or, you can modify the quality of another potential game action. Put a plus one plus one or a minus one minus one counter on a creature, scry the top card of your library to the bottom, or block an incoming attacker. Finally, you can attempt to modify the clock on a win condition, such as attacking an opponent to lower their life totals, or giving a player poison counters, or attempting to use a card with a win the game clause on it. Basically, anytime you physically manipulate a card by moving it somewhere new, you've taken a game action. Game actions in Magic are a little bit different than on other tabletop games. In Magic, the game actions have a cost associated with them apart from the action itself. In general, the fundamental cost of any game action is that it limits our ability to take other game actions later in the turn cycle. The most straightforward and easy to understand cost is the mana cost associated with that action. Game actions which cost more mana are usually more prohibitive to complete. Another critical but misunderstood cost is the card itself. We'll discuss this in more detail shortly, but this is what we mean when we ask if an effect is worth a card, or worth a slot in a deck. Even activated abilities without a mana cost present a cost. If you tap your commander, Drawn Lu Lichlord, to cast Brainstorm from your graveyard, you've lost the ability to cast Pognify out of the graveyard later in the turn cycle. So what makes commander different? The difference that commander players face, as opposed to simple 1 versus 1 or 60 card formats, is that they have not one, but three separate opponents to contend with. By the basic rules of the game, a player's opponents in a game of commander will take three times the game action that the individual player is able to take, drawing three cards per turn cycle, playing three lands per turn cycle, etc., etc. In Commander, the game is about creating and exploiting a resource imbalance. This is done primarily by creating an advantage in game actions that opponents are not able to overcome. Having three opponents means that we will often talk about our cards being high impact, this is our classic Commander thinking, our go big or go home mentality in Commander. A high impact card is going to allow you to take multiple game actions for the price of a single card. Wrath of God is the classic go-to example. You cast a spell which allows you to move multiple creatures belonging to your opponents to the graveyard. A more high impact example would be Merciless Eviction, which allows you to move multiple cards of a given type that you choose into Exile, where they are harder to interact with or retrieve later in the game. Some game actions are more important than others. Moving 20 one plant creature tokens into the graveyard is probably lower impact than moving 20 dragons from the battlefield into the graveyard. This leads to the question of whether or not an effect is worth a card. How much does a card need to be able to do? How high impact does it need to be, 
and how many game actions does it need to grant you before it's actually worth a card. The impact of card need to be weighed against its efficiency as well as the opportunity cost to play it. When we talk about efficiency, it's hard not to talk about Swords to Plowshares. Swords to Plowshares is much more efficient than Wrath of God, costing a single white mana versus two white white, but the impact of Wrath of God is usually higher, usually destroying multiple opposing creatures, while Swords to Plowshares only removes one. Crafty Cut Purse is a very high impact card against a Dockside Extortionist, allowing you to steal all those treasure tokens that your opponent would have made otherwise. But the opportunity cost to play a card like Blind Obedience is much lower, and still shuts down most Dockside combos while also hitting other strategies quite hard. The opportunity cost of a card in your deck is the cost of needing to choose between it and one other card that can do more different things. You only have 99 slots plus your commander to work with after all. How often will the card be a draw which does not grant you additional potential game actions? This is why the average mana value of commander decks has been getting lower as time has progressed. More and more, those powerful 7 and 8 drop spells are not representing new game actions when you draw them. You need to spend a lot of time and resources to ramp to a level where they actually do become potential game actions. The other question to ask is, how many scenarios can you craft where you have the mana available to cast the spell, and the spell is impactful? There are a lot of cards which have very powerful corner case scenarios, like the crafty cut purse we mentioned above, but it's really hard to come up with scenarios on a consistent basis where it's worth holding up those three mana and spending a slot in your deck on this card. We've described a lot of cards as being high impact when they enable you to take a large number of game actions, but not all game actions are created equal. Some are more powerful and more useful than others. A well-built deck in Commander is designed to make the actions it takes highly impactful, even if they wouldn't be otherwise. Nyath of the Dire Hunt, for instance, makes the relatively low-impact class of spells known as fight spells extremely potent forms of removal by rewarding you with a card every time you send a creature of yours off to brawl. In general, the most impactful game actions are going to get you ahead on resources or put your opponents behind on resources. Destroying an opponent's Rhystic Study, which triggers every time any of their opponents cast a spell, is often a much higher impact game action than destroying their propaganda. That calculus might change, though. If you or another player are looking to swing in and destroying that propaganda, that could put the blue player at a critically low life total. It usually comes down to threat assessment. If you identify a way to deny opponents multiple game actions, that is likely a high-value target. So let's talk about what enables multiple game actions. What are the cornerstones of most commander decks? Card draw and ramp. And what are some of the most powerful things you can do in commander? Cheating of mana costs. The limiting factor for most game actions in magic is access to cards to use or mana to cast those cards. In commander, value decks are often looking for engine cards to start to multiply their game actions. In CDH, cards like Ad Nauseam allow a player to add 20 plus cards to their hands relatively easily. Outside of CDH, big draw spells provide similar access to large numbers of spells, as do draw engines like Ristic Study, Mystic Remora, or Consecrated Sphinx. Don't forget about Timna the Weaver either, we did a whole episode on her. Yawgmoth's Will was another classic CDH piece used in combination with a stocked graveyard as a way to go for it but it's been largely supplanted by the new Underworld Breach, which can fuel the graveyard with a number of combos while attempting to go for it. Commanders who can access large numbers of cards, the classic card advantage in the Command Zone commanders, are usually going to be good targets for removal to slow opponents down. Timna I've already mentioned, but don't forget about the access the creatures can provide to the graveyard, such as in a Marin deck, or the top card of opponents' libraries when Paco starts attacking. Activated abilities, which act like mana sinks, such as the ones printed on Kenrith Returned King, are powerful even if they're overcosted, because they allow you to take game actions without needing to spend a card in your hand. The other limiting factor which players need to overcome is to gain access to lots of mana. We've described in our video on Ready, Set, Go that players advance from the getting ready stage of the game to the all set up stage when they can multispell. Most of the getting ready stage of the game is devoted to ramping to the point where mana is not stopping your ability to take the game actions you need to advance your own game plan and also be able to stymie your opponent's plans. 
As a deck archetype, landfall decks tend to oops into lots of mana by simple virtue of their decks wanting to trigger landfall multiple times. Other decks might enable lots of mana directly off of their commander, such as Keen and Bonder Prodigy giving you extra mana from rocks and mana dorks. There are several common CDH win conditions which involve getting large or even infinite amounts of mana from cards like Food Chain or Isochron Scepter with dramatic reversal. Unbounded mana, combined with an activated ability like those found on Thrasios, Triton Hero, allows you to draw your deck, or the ability on Keen and Bonder Prodigy, which allows you to cast all the non-human creatures in your deck. Cost-reducing effects are similar, but not quite the same. They generate a form of virtual mana. The more game actions, which they reduce the cost of per cycle, the more powerful they are. These include the cycle of medallions originally printed in Tempest, which reduced the cost of a particular color of spells, Goblin Electromancer, which drops the cost of instants and sorceries, as well as effects like Training Grounds, which lower the cost of activated abilities. And, of course, as I mentioned, we can't get around not talking about cheating of mana costs. You can sometimes gain access to extra game actions, and often much more impactful ones than would otherwise be possible, when you can get a permanent into play without paying for its mana cost, such as using Reanimate to bring back a creature like Razaketh, the Foul-Blooded, or bringing Omniscience into play off of the Death Trigger for Academy Rector. Finally, the critical piece in Commander is often the use and reuse of triggered abilities on permanence. Creatures with potent ETBs are among the most played cards in the format, with Eternal Witness, Reclamation Sage, and Sun Titan all in the top 10 most played creatures according to data from EDHRAC.com. Guardian Project often comes to mind for a lot of Commander players as a format-defining triggered ability, tacking on a second game action to each non-token creature that enters the battlefield under your control of Draw a Card. Combine that with creature cards that already have a triggered ability on them when they enter the battlefield, like Reclamation Sage, and now you get three game actions for the cost of a single card. You have a creature that can attack or block, you have the ability to destroy an artifact or an enchantment on enter the battlefield, and you get to draw a card. Rhystic Study is similar in terms of power, but requires even less input from the player who casts it. It creates a trigger for a potential game action anytime any opponent casts any spell. Alright, now let's tie it all together. We've discussed the flow of the game of Commander before, describing the stages as ready, set, go. I'm going to review them briefly for us, but we do have a full video you can go back and review at your leisure. Getting ready. Deploying resources to help you reach the next stage of the game, often casting the ramp spells. You're investing resources now, at the very beginning of the game, so you can have more options for more game actions later. All set up is when you can multi-spell. You can regularly and consistently take multiple game actions, allowing you to both advance your own game plan and answer your opponent's game actions that they are taking. Finally, after you're all set up, it's time to go for it. You can overwhelm your opponents with your game actions and invest game actions into reducing the clock for one or more win conditions which you are currently pursuing. Just as the highest impact cards you can play are often the ones that let you take lots of game actions, sometimes the most powerful plays that you can make are the ones that answer an opponent's attempt to take multiple game actions. Countering an opponent's Wrath of God, particularly when you have a significant advantage of creatures on the board, that can be a very powerful effect to take, allowing you to maintain a powerful presence on the board and denying them tons of game actions. Destroying an opponent's Rhystic Study to prevent them from drawing more cards. Again, a huge way to return balance to the game actions between you and your opponents. Even destroying a Mana Rock to limit their mana available and thus the number of game actions they can take on their next turn can potentially represent a major setback. Think about the times you've managed to see a mana rock or a ramp destroyed when the player was just about to be able to cast their commander and really get their game plan going. It can be devastating when timed properly. When you get the sense that you're losing the game but can't tell why, look at the board of the person who is winning and see if there's any particular permanent that they've been profiting from a lot and count the game actions they take with it each turn cycle. This is one of the things that led to me really appreciating Krom Ludovic's Opus in games of CDH, for just the number of times that I wound up drawing extra cards off of his ability whenever an opponent cast two or more spells in a single turn, draw a card. A great way to refill your hand in a game of CDH 
where a lot of game actions are happening very regularly. This is also a great way to improve your skills with threat assessment, recognizing when a card allows an opponent to take multiple game actions and potentially start going for it much sooner than they would be otherwise. Recognizing, too, which cards are going to allow you to take more game actions and what the cost of those game actions will be, this can be a great way to make your choice between cards that are going to make the cut for your deck or ones that are going to be the 101st and 102nd card that you're going to need to save for another day. Look for those game actions. What is going to allow you to move a card into the graveyard, take a card out of the graveyard, draw a card? What is going to allow you to modify the quality of other cards in play? And what is going to change the clock for you winning the game? These are the things to keep in mind when you're looking at your decks, looking at cards, and looking at the game state in general. It's a lot to take in, so try these exercises. Sit down at the board when you're trying to decide what to do, and just look at permanence. Which ones are going to allow their players to take multiple game actions? Ristic Study, classic example. What spells are going to allow multiple game actions? Wrath of God, classic example. Try to think about it this way. It may open your eyes to a whole new way to look at the board and to look at deck building. Well, that about wraps it up for this deep dive into some of the more esoteric concepts behind the mechanics of magic. There's no way I can mention all of the powerful engine cards or even the small role players in the format, so I want to know what some of your favorites are. Leave us a message on YouTube, where we are Gemstone Mine Podcast. You can add us on Twitter, where we are at Gemstone Mine MTG, or send us an email, where we are Gemstone Mine Podcast at gmail.com. Until next time, I'm John, and this is Gemstone Mine.